Welcome to Seattle Community Church. Thanks for joining us this morning. And as we come into worship, I have a couple of announcements to share with you. The first one is that our Vacation Bible School, VBS, is continuing to happen in the month of August. So if you would like to have your child participate, please contact Esther at children's at seattlechurch.org or you can go to our website for more information. The second announcement is that our women's ministry is preparing care packages for the at-risk women at Penny's Place and Mary's Place. If you would like to help out by donating goods like toothbrush, uh, face facial products, or feminine products, you can drop them off at church on Tuesday between 10 and 2 p.m. Also, once again, if you would like more information, please go to our website and you can uh, get more information there. Or you could contact Tina Gu. And I won't give out her personal information, but please contact ministry at seattlechurch.org and we can get you that information. Thanks a lot. Now let's join Tony as he leads us in some praise songs. Hi, my name is Tony and I'm one of the worship directors here at Seattle Community Church. We are glad you're here to worship with us. Let us sing to the Lord. same God that never fails 
will not fail me now. You won't fail me now. Amen. We serve an almighty God. Let us greet one another in the name of Jesus during this passing of the peace. Peace be with you. Let us pray. Lord, I thank you for gathering us here today, even through this tough and difficult time. I pray as we listen to your message that we are able to hear you and what you want to say to us. I pray that whatever anyone is going through, that they know that you're with them. And I thank you for everything that you have done. Amen. Good morning and welcome. I am so glad that you have joined us this morning as we are continuing our series on the Psalms. My name is Pastor Brenna. If this is one of the first times you've joined us, we are so glad that you are here. You know, over the past few weeks, we have been learning how the Psalms help us to communicate with God, how they teach us about ourselves and others and the very nature of God. In the Psalter, we find a space to be truly ourselves in all of our pain and in all of our brokenness. We're invited through them to say things we would never say out loud and to demand God act on our behalf and avenge us. But there's more than just pain and anger and sorrow in the Psalms. There's another type of deep and complex emotion that weaves its way through. And that emotion is joy. You know, in our current world and context, joy and happiness are often used interchangeably. Anything that makes us feel good for just a moment can either be referred to by happiness or joy. And yet scripturally and psychologically, the two terms are not quite the same. They don't carry the same meaning. Dr. Pamela King, who is a professor and a researcher and a psychologist, has spent years and a good portion of her career trying to understand what joy is and how it plays out in humans. And through her research, she has found that, as one would guess, happiness is an emotional response. It's in the response to something pleasant, whether it be a good meal or getting an A on our test or the sunshine on our face. But joy, joy is a lot more complex. Because what she's found through all her research is that joy involves an appraisal of what is important in our life. And it involves an understanding of purpose, which is why joy can be found in so many places that one would never expect to find it. You see, joy, she writes, is most fully understood as a virtue, one that involves our thoughts and our feelings and our actions in response to what matters most in our lives. Thus, she says, joy is an enduring, deep delight in what holds the most significance. Joy is our delight when we experience and celebrate and anticipate the manifestation of all of those things that we hold with the most significance, the most dear, like a birth or a graduation or a wedding. It compares itself to sorrow, which is our response to the violation and destruction and deterioration of such sacred things. You know, I can remember with distinct clarity the moment I finally understood what this looked like. You see, in 2010, I, with about 12 of my other friends and people I was with, got on a plane and flew down to Haiti. We were there to work on a water project and do some construction on a school, helping out a rural community in the northwest corner of the country. We'd only been there for about three or four days when we were hanging out in the team house and all of a sudden the ground began to shake. And if you recall, that earthquake in Haiti in 2010 was devastating. It was a magnitude 7.0 and approximately 
3 million people were affected. The earthquake was the most devastating natural disaster that the country had ever experienced. A country that was already the poorest in the Western Hemisphere. Some 250,000 lives were lost. Another 300,000 people were injured. A million and a half people were forced to leave their destroyed homes and make it a makeshift internally displaced persons camp. They were living in horrible conditions and in tents. The country faced the greatest humanitarian need it had ever seen in its history. Entire towns were decimated to rubble and the devastation was absolute. And yet, when we went to church that Sunday, when we gathered with the people in that community, we walked in to find a room of people dancing and singing with their hands raised in praise and gratitude to God. In a space where there should have been nothing but mourning and sorrow, instead we found a holy joy. And it was probably the first time I understood why joy is included on that list in Galatians as one of the fruits of the Spirit. Because even as those people mourned loved ones and homes and jobs, they found a way to offer praise and joy to God for providing for them and keeping them from harm and bringing resources for help to them. That ability to understand the meaning of their life and God's love for them allowed joy to come from the spirit where it should have been impossible. And our psalm for today shows us what it looks like to be a people who live into that virtue of joy. It teaches us how joy is a vital part of our relationship with God. So hear the word of God found in Psalm 126. When the Lord changed Zion's circumstances for the better, it was like we had been dreaming. Our mouths were suddenly filled with laughter. Our tongues were filled with joyful shouts. It was even said at that time among the nations, the Lord has done great things things for them. Yes, the Lord has done great things for them. And we are overjoyed. Lord, change our circumstances for the better. Like dry streams in the desert waste, let those who plant with tears reap the harvest with joyful shouts. Let those who go out crying and carrying their seed come home with joyful shouts, carrying bales of grain. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I don't know about any of you watching, but I need this psalm in my life right now. Because at the moment, it feels like the world is far more aligned with our psalms of sorrow and anger and lament that we've been looking at the past couple of weeks. It feels brutal and angry and violent and isolating most days. And the reality is, without wanting to be Pollyanna, I need to find joy in my life. I want to find joy in my life and every day. And maybe that's why I find the first couple of lines of this psalm so incredibly powerful and moving. When the Lord changed our circumstances for the better, we were like those who dreamed. The people of God in this psalm are looking back, they're remembering reflecting on the goodness of God's grace in times long past. 
They're remembering God rescuing them from slavery and the desert and the exile and death. And they're remembering what it felt like to know that God was with them and chose them and saved them and called them home. And it's not a group of people who are pretending that there were not hard times. No, the author of this psalm understands that it was, in fact, out of that pain that God delivered the people. And I think this is what Dr. Pamela King means when she talks about joy occurring only when we take stock of what is important and understand our purpose in the world. Because here we see the people of God understanding the importance of knowing that they were beloved by God above all nations. That their purpose was to be the faithful people of God, a God who would not let them down. And that knowing and that understanding frames their current unpleasant situation with a soul deep joy just like it did the people I met in Haiti. And now, once again, in the psalm, the people have found themselves in the midst of trouble, and so they cry out, Lord, change our circumstances for the better. Like dry streams in the desert waste, let those who plant with tears reap the harvest with joyful shouts. And let those who go out crying and carrying their seed come home with joyful shouts, carrying bales of grain. It's a beautiful cry to God. And I would imagine it's a prayer that a lot of us have been uttering lately. Lord, change our circumstances for the better. Replace our tears, bring us home with shouts of joy to one another once again. The Psalms never deny the pain and the reality of our lives, but they do invite us to place our stories in the proper perspective, to remember what is really important and why we are here. And right now, I feel like I can say rather unequivocally that things do seem pretty terrible. The pandemic has stripped away many of the things and experiences that bring us happiness. The good nights out at restaurants with friends, the shopping, the sports teams that we all love. Social unrest has called into question the very values and history of our society. The economy and the loss of jobs has brought unimaginable stress and fear to millions. And yet, in all of that, Eden and Max were born, and Claire graduated, and my sister is getting married next week. And people have found themselves changing habits to reflect passions they never knew they had, and leaving careers that have conflicted with their faith and their calling of humanity. And families have found time to gather at dinner tables once again, now that sports and school have been stripped away. Even in having to simplify and to slow down, we connect once again to our purpose of being rather than doing, and we find joy. We find it in our families and in our friends and in our love and in justice and in life. Because these are the things we know that are truly important. And in the midst of trouble, there is always joy to be found if you know where to look and who to look to. The Psalms, particularly the Psalms of Ascent, declare to God that joy is found when we approach God's presence, when we recognize God's movement in our lives. 
most importantly, these psalms acknowledge that joy finds its fullest expression not in isolation or individuals, but in community. Like a mosaic or a stained glass window, a million different shining pieces that on their own are pretty enough but pulled together reflect all of the different shades and shapes become breathtaking. The people of God experience the joy of the Spirit when they gather together to offer praise, and that's where it's found in its most fullest. And yeah, we are physically apart right now. But my friends, we are lucky that we live in a time that allows us to continue to connect to one another, to share these important connections, even though we're apart, so that we can continue to foster joy. And though many of us are Zoomed and Google Meets and Microsoft teamed out, we cannot forget that we find our meaning and our purpose not alone, but as members of the family of God. And we need one another. We need one another to remind us of when God saved us before, to pray for us for God's saving action now, and to point us towards what matters most and who matters most. If you have found yourself drifting away from the church or your small group during this time, I really want to encourage you to reach back out and connect because it is incredibly important that we stay together. And if you don't have a small group and you want to start one or you want to join one, just email me and let me know. You know, through my own faith journey, I have found that small groups have been one of the most important places for me to understand who I am and what matters in my life as I journey together with other beloved children of God. Those are the people who remind me and pray with me and walk with me from tears into shouts of joy. Dr. King in her research goes on to say that She's identified three different areas that deeply inform joy in humans. The first is this growing in authenticity and living more into one's strength. The second thing that contributes to joy is the growing in the depth of relationships and contributing to others. And the last thing she found that connects people to joy is living more aligned with one's ethical and spiritual ideals. And I cannot think of a better place to work out these three contributors to joy than in the family of God. Because that is the place where we are encouraged to be ourselves and live into our strength and our spirituality as we connect with others. And so I want us to take a moment and pause here. I want you at home to take the next 60 seconds wherever you are and whoever you are with. And I want you to think about what has brought you joy in the last six months. If you're worshiping with your family, go ahead and share it with one another. If you're alone, write it down. If you're watching with us live on YouTube, go ahead and put it in the comment section or in the live chat so that we can know what is bringing you joy. I'll be back in 60 seconds. In this moment, 
we can see in practice how the things that bring us joy are most often tied to those things which carry deep meaning in our lives. People we love, the God we worship, the values that we hold dear. But I wonder for how many of you that that was a difficult exercise. And it is absolutely okay if it was. After all, while the reality is that joy is natural, it does not always come naturally, especially in the middle of a global pandemic and national unrest. Sometimes it turns out we need to work at joy, to cultivate it. We need to tend to those things and activities and relationships and beliefs that are life-giving. And that means becoming more aware, more aware of when we feel profound joy and pursuing those things intentionally. In other words, we are called to make joy a habit. You see, the Psalms were Israel's way of making joy a habit. They would sing them together when things felt tough or scary. They would sing them together in the synagogue. They would sing them in the markets and they would sing when they were busy and they would sing when they were worshiping and they would sing when they were traveling. By including the Psalms of joy in the Psalter, the Jewish people made sure that vocalizing joy before God, recognizing joy before God, became a constant habit. And so today, I'm going to do something that I rarely do in a sermon. And I am going to give you homework. Now, I can't make you do it, but I really hope that you will take it to heart because I think it's an important practice. This week, you don't have to do it tonight, but sometime this week, I want you to take some time and focus on getting clear about what brings you life-giving joy and how you can make joy a habit. You can do it at the end of each week or at the end of each day, but spend time reflecting. Think about when you experienced the most joy or felt the most alive. Get curious about those moments in your week or in your life. Take notes or journal or tell someone about it. And more than that, take some time to reflect on your life. What seasons and memories and elements of your life have brought you the most joy? And finally this, consider how your beliefs may provide hope for your future and be a source of anticipated joy. See, when we can identify and name things that bring us joy, we too, like the Israelites, can declare to God in the midst of trouble that we are like those who dream, that we remember God's faithful presence and that we too can find joy in the midst of sorrow. And if it's something you're interested in pursuing more, I want to offer you another invitation to join me this fall. I'm going to be doing a self-guided study on joy starting in October. I'll have some joy journals available that can help you spend three months working on making joy a habit. It can help you identify the things that bring you joy and share it with others. If you're interested in doing this with me, you can place a request for one of these journals online. You can go on our website uh, under the challenges tab and the deadline for signing up to receive a journal will be September 20th. You know, I know I need more joy in my life, and I'm not very good at making it a habit. And so this is my way of trying to do that. One of my favorite memories, though, that brings me joy was as a little girl. And I can remember sitting on my bed with my dad reading to me the poems of Shel Silverstein. I would curl up and lean against him, and we would laugh and joke and read. And when I look back now, I see that in those moments, the reason it brings me such joy is because it's when I knew what mattered the most. And that was my dad and I and 
our relationship and that feeling of love and safety. And so when I look back and read those same poems now, I always do so with a smile. And I was going back recently looking over them and I found one I loved. It's titled, How Many, How Much? And it goes like this. How many slams in an old screen door? Depends on how loud you shut it. How many slices in a bread? Depends on how thin you cut it. How much good inside a day? Depends how good you live them. How much love inside a friend? Depends how much you give them. Moments of joy, I think, are a lot like that poem. That when it comes to measuring it, there is no easy standard. It depends on who is doing the living and on who is doing the counting. And as a fruit of the spirit, joy isn't something that we can create. Instead, it's something that we cultivate in ourselves. And it comes from knowing God, from knowing that we belong to God and who God is. And the closer we draw to God, the more we understand what is truly important in our lives, the clearer we understand our purpose as children of God, the more moments of joy we will know. And so if I could change Shell's poem a bit, I would add one last line. How much joy inside a life depends how close you know him. May your days be filled with joy. May you know what matters. May you understand your purpose in this place. And may you share it with others. Amen. Friends, one of the things that God says is that he loves a cheerful giver. This doesn't mean that we're always just happy-go-lucky. It means that we want to give out of a place in our hearts that is similar to that place of joy, that recognizes what's important and why we serve God. And so we're inviting you in this time to go ahead, pop online, go onto our website. You can go to the Give page. Uh, you can give online. You can send in a check, whatever works for you. But help us to continue to serve God and serve God's kingdom in this world so that we can help spread joy as people understand what is important and who loves them. Thanks. Thank you for the message. Church, let's sing together in the joy of the Lord. I'm trading my sorrows I'm trading my shame I'm laying them down For the joy of the Lord I'm trading my sickness I'm trading my pain I'm laying them down For the joy of the Lord Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Amen. I'm trading my sorrows. I'm trading my shame. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. 
Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, amen. Well, I'm pressed, well, I'm pressed, but not crushed, persecuted, not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. I'm blessed beyond the curse, for His promise will endure, that His joy is going to be my strength. Though the sorrow may last for the night, His joy comes with the morning. I'm trading my sorrows, I'm trading my shame, I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. I'm trading my sickness, I'm trading my pain I'm laying them down For the joy of the Lord We say yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, amen Come on, church, I can't hear you Sing it louder we say yes lord yes lord yes yes lord yes lord yes lord yes yes lord yes lord yes lord yes yes lord amen oh. amen amen and now a blessing from our elder let us bow our heads for the benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Have a great week.